The culture of writing in the Serbian community in Windsor has been quite strong since the 1920s. The first Serbian immigrants began migrating into the area from various places in the states as early as 1910, exploring the job market and looking for a relatively friendly place to settle. Many of them did not have any or had very little formal education, but they had a natural intelligence which helped them understand the new system of living, to adopt the new system of living, and to thrive within it. The mid-1920s were years when larger groups of Serbs came to Windsor, about 40 families to be more precise, who adjusted very quickly to the new environment and they looked to form their own community as they depended on the Detroit Serbian Orthodox Church Ravanica for their spiritual and social needs. Many became workers at the Ford factory or were scrambling for survival doing odd jobs. The first settlers were quick learners but were not intellectuals. However, there were amongst them few who stood out as organizers and founders of several early community organizations. As such, they were in charge of documenting administrative work and occasionally writing articles on their work to the American Serbobran newspaper in Pittsburgh informing the wider Serbian readership on their affairs and successes. Few organizations were established in the 1920s, but one that was the most significant was the Yugoslavian Soko Association. It was created in 1929 by Mr. Petar Bulat and 50 other initial members, following the example of the same organization from the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. The reason it was so significant is because it promoted athletic and cultural activities within the Serbian community. Its literary section promoted poetry recitals and small theater productions. It created its own small library of books in Serbian language where the few better educated individuals were able to organize literary and theatrical evenings with great frequency and attendance. Some even transcribed comedies and one-act satirical works in order to have a copy for the library and use them as an inspiration for further literary creativity. So as you see, due to this organization, the first literary attempts were made and kept in the theatrical format as a cultural experience within the community. By the mid-30s, the Serbian community in Windsor expanded and formed a good number of other cultural and political organizations. Each of them had an informative medium in the form of, of pamphlets, bulletins, and newsletters. American Serbobran from Pittsburgh was coming in, the Voice of Canada weekly newspaper was also distributed from Toronto, and there were news agents who tried to distribute locally the newspapers from home, although with a significant delay. The Serbian community in Windsor also had its own printmaster who went by the name of Savo Kovac. He was an active member of the Serbian National Shield Society and he wrote newspaper articles for American Serbobran and Voice of Canada newspapers as early as 1931 through 1934 and 5. He also owned a small printing press that would serve many needs of the entire community. Savo Kovac and Petar Bulat stand out as the two individuals who wrote more than others in their community simply because of the roles they played in it. And simply because of the personal interest they had at the time. They were not perhaps writers in the form that we are used to, but they have provided opportunities for amateur writers to tackle small theater productions, epic and lyrical poetry, essays, and simple advertisements. Each in his own manner, both have helped the written heritage and language to thrive. Savo Kovac was born in 1901 in Lapac, Herzegovina. As one of the numerous children, he needed to find a way to earn a living. He boarded a train in Zagreb, leaving behind Vukan and Angelka and his three siblings, and he traveled to France, where he boarded the ship Melida. His aim was to arrive to Canada, board the train to Winnipeg, and start a physical labor at one of the local farms. He came with the Canadian Pacific affidavit work visa, which granted him safe passage to his destination. Many came through the same channel. 
Sava tells us in one of the interviews for the museum that he did not have any connections or acquaintances upon arrival. After a season in Winnipeg, he also farmed in Kapuskasing, he felled lumber in Raymond, and he mined in Levak and Timmins at Hollinger Mines. However, he always found time to write and send in his articles to many different Serbian newspapers. He married his wife Pavia Milković in Timmins in 1938. The family moved to Toronto, but the same rhythm of hard physical labor and odd jobs that didn't require too much English followed. After several years, he purchased the Buffalo House restaurant, which he tried to revive with few of his partners and friends. It was not successful. He then decided to move to Windsor in the fall of 1941. Aside from trying to run his own business, Savo Kovac was very active in social and cultural life of the Serbian community in Toronto and later in Windsor. When Voice of Canada, a weekly newspaper, was established by Božidar Marković in Toronto in 34. Savo joined the ranks of many renowned and civilian contributors writing about the settlement of Serbs in Canada, about national issues, and he gave comments on political currents in Kingdom of Yugoslavia. He was a freelance writer for the Unity in Chicago, American Serbobran in Pittsburgh, and Voice of Canadian Serbs from 1945 in Windsor, and later for the Canadian Serbobran in Hamilton. He even wrote for Pravda from Yugoslavia in 1938. Mr. Kovac was also a very active member of the Serbian National Shield Society of Canada since his days in Toronto, and as such was a part of the group which brought the Voice of Canada from Toronto to Windsor in 1945. Since he already owned a small printing press he operated for a few years, he was asked to investigate and purchase the adequate print presses and set up a print shop. By his own admission, he was not a very experienced typesetter, but he, has, he learned quickly. He also has acted as a printer, writer, and editor for two years, until Dr. Jovan Jovetic took the position of editor-in-chief. Savo Kovac worked hard side-by-side -side with Pero Bulat, Pajo Popov, Petar Tjuk, and others to ensure the continuity of the Serbian language newspaper. Savo Kovac was known and remembered as a hot-tempered man whose writing had many times a passionate tone. He died on January 17th, 1984, in Windsor. Pero Bulat was born in 1899 in Brgin Most in Kordun, region in the present-day Croatia. His parents, Rada and Sava, had 15 children. Pero served in the Royal Air Force and was discharged in 1920. His first destination was Western Canada in 1926, but his first employment was with a mining company in Sudbury. Later, he was a miner in Schumacher. Finally, he came to Windsor, where he had established himself pretty quickly by opening up the European Tavern Restaurant, which was very popular and very well attended. Before his arrival to Canada, he was the member of the Yugoslav Soko Association in Croatia and brought over many ideas on how the social life of Serbs in Windsor could best be organized. He had a very clear vision on how to promote and preserve the Serbian identity in foreign dominant culture. First, he was the secretary at the Yugoslav Soko Association of East Windsor, then he became its president in 1939. After this society dissolved due to a financial strain, Pedro Bullet became the board member of the Canadian Yugoslav Club in Windsor. Afterwards, he became a member of the Serbian National Shield Society and he helped its revival greatly after years of stagnation. From that platform, he was able to bridge the gap between the Serbian community in Windsor and the Windsor Liberal Party representatives bringing in great support for the party's various causes. He was a part of the SNSS delegation to Ottawa to request that the Canadian government allow immigration of the Serbian prisoners of war in 1947. Pedro Bulat was contributing articles to a variety of Serbian language publications in the wider region, just like his contemporary Savo Kovac. However, the most important role Pero Bulat played for the preservation of their written heritage and Serbian language was to bring the Voice of Canadian Serbs newspaper to Windsor as an official media of the Serbian National Shield Society, where he was a longtime president. 
He had a very clear understanding of the importance to create opportunities for Serbs to voice their concerns through a regular and a serious newspaper. This effort of establishing a third oldest Serbian newspaper published in continuation in winter brought enormous success in journalistic efforts of Serbian diaspora in Canada and elsewhere. Thanks to his efforts, Voice of Canadian Serbs and later Aval Printing and Publishing Company attracted the best pens and most accomplished intellectuals of Serbian language to write and publish from all over the world. He was its chairman from 1954 to 1983. Because of the newspaper and the publishing house, Windsor was placed on the map as an important cultural center for Serbs in Ontario and in Canada. It attracted writers, poets, diplomats, professors, Montenegrin royals, as well as Serbian politicians, dissidents, and ordinary citizens who all wanted to write. Petar Bullet knew how to cultivate those connections and bring forth their best potential. The address, 1297 Drullard Road in Windsor, has an enormous importance for the preservation of Serbian language through journalism, writing, and publishing, not only for the local community, but for all Serbs in diaspora. Serbs all over the world knew of this address and of the activities done there. This small building of a modest facade housed the third oldest newspaper in Serbian language run in continuation to date and the first publishing house in the free world. For Serbs worldwide, this address was the most important location where their heritage and history was being made, recorded and preserved. Many Serbian writers, who were incredibly accomplished in diplomatic and political circles, wrote about the history of Serbs, political issues, social problems very relevant to Serbs in newly formed socialist Yugoslavia and those scattered all over the globe. The following names are just some of the writers congregated around AVA Publishing and the Voice of Canadian Serbs newspaper. Here are some names you should know about. Slobodan Jovanović was a Serbian Foreign Service official, professor of constitutional law at the University of Belgrade. He was a politician of the Serbian government in exile in London during World War II. As a writer, he is one of Serbia's most prolific jurists, historians, sociologists, journalists, and literary critics. He distinguished himself with a characteristically clear and sharp writing style later called the Belgrade style. Adam Pribicevic was a political leader of Serbs in the Austro-Hungarian Empire and he fought for the improvement of their human rights and political representation. In the period between the wars, he was a very significant political figure. Among the Serbian Canadians, Adam Pribicevic was among the most important, eminent and well-known post-World War II Serbian political emigres who came from Yugoslavia to Canada. He created the Yugoslav Observer, which was a monthly newspaper in English and Democratic Thought, also a monthly newspaper in Serbian with Fedor Aic. He wrote many non-fiction books about the position of the peasant in Serbia, the importance of traditional values of rural life, of the atrocities suffered by Serbs in the Nazi state of Croatia in the World War II, etc. Kosta Pavlovic was a diplomat in the Kingdom of Yugoslavia government. He was a jurist and a politician best known to have been the tutor of His Highness King Petar Karadjordjevic of Serbia. He resided in London. Rado Knežević was a minister at the royal court in the Kingdom of Yugoslavia and a diplomat in the Serbian government in exile in London during World War II. He was also the French language tutor to His Highness King Petar Karadjordjevic of Serbia. After wo World War II, he immigrates to Canada and moves to Windsor where he becomes the editor of The Voice of Canadian Serbs and he holds this position between 1961 and 1974. The image here dates from the 1956 Windsor, where you see Mr. Bulat shaking hands with Rado Knežević. Mr. Knežević was here to promote his book, Book About Draža 1 and 2. Later, Mr. Bulat will invite Rado Knežević to take over the position of the editor-in-chief of The Voice of Canadian Serbs. The other image you see here is a small group of prolific writers and editors connected to the newspaper. 
Olga B. Markovic, Mr. Ostovic, Velimir Toshkovic, Pero Bulat, Fedor Aic, and others. What you see here is the book by Pero Bulat, Serbs in Canada, Their Immigration, Social and Economic Life, which was published in 1952 by the Voice of Canadian Serbs Press. Interestingly, only two years later, the Voice of Canadian Serbs Press will become the Avala Printing and Publishing Company. As many Serbs were fleeing the socialist Yugoslavia in the makings right after the World War II, they spent some time in the civilian refugee camps all over Europe. From there, their uncertain status would be somehow sorted out and many immigrated to Canada in 1947 and 1948. Some available accounts mention up to 15,000 people that arrived within the time. Most of them were well-educated, formerly wealthy and influential individuals who wrote about political problems, social tensions, and their own memories of World War II. Most of the articles or books published during the 50s and 60s somehow tried to decipher the tragic transition of ideology and way of life from parliamentary monarchy to communist one-party system. Many of these texts are giving a very different account and perspective on the significant moments of Yugoslavian history that were, up until recently, forbidden to wider readership. Adam Pribicic was a Serbian publisher, writer, and a politician. He was born in Kostajnica to a family of Serbs. The annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1908 caused a fear among the Serbs of Austria-Hungary. It became a major factor in the high treason trial of Zagreb in 1909 against the Serb leaders of the Croat-Serb coalition, which opposed the annexation. Adam and his brother Valerian Pribicic, a Serbian Orthodox bishop, figured prominently among the defendants. On October 9, 1909, the court in Zagreb passed its sentence. Twelve years penal servitude for the brothers and severe terms of imprisonment of between five and eight years for 30 other defendants. Following a subsequent libel suit in Vienna, they were all fully exonerated in a legal sense a year later, and it became apparent that the evidence in the earlier trial had been fabricated with the foreknowledge of the Austro-Hungarian authorities. When the Great War broke out, Adam was arrested by the Austrians and in 1915 sent to Galicia as an Austrian soldier to fight the Russians. There, he used the opportunity to defect to the Russian side. From there, he joined the Serbian volunteers fighting within the Serbian army on the Salonika front. After the war, Pribicevic, a student of Tomasz Garigu Masaryk, met up with his brother Svetozar Pribicevic and joined the Democratic Party. Between the two world wars, he held many important posts in Yugoslavia. He was a jurist and a journalist who, with his brother Milan Pribicevic, became the voice of the return to the virtues of rural life. When Nazi Germany occupied the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, Pribicic joined the Chetnik forces of General Dragoljub Mihailovic at Ravnagora, fighting both the Nazi and communist invaders alike. The political and socio-economic platform for the Chetnik Congress was drafted by Pribicic. When George Mussolini organized the 1944 final rescue of 500 American airmen called Operation Hellard, Mihailovic sent a political mission to Bari, Italy, aboard an American plane. Pribicevic, now former president of the Independent Democratic Party of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, and his team met with Ivan Šubašić, but were not informed of the Tito-Šubašić agreement. Pribicevic remained in the West after the war ended, like thousands of other soldiers who managed to escape. He settled in Windsor, but the circumstances were not in his favor. The stage for which he wholeheartedly fought his entire life had disintegrated. 
Serbs in Croatia experienced enormous atrocities and his former Croatian political allies had betrayed him. He then in turn devoted all his energies to organize Serbian immigrants in Windsor in the region into a coherent and a self-sufficient unit. He devoted himself to writing articles for Voice of Canadian Serbs, American Serbobran, and left behind several books treating the historic and political issues the Serbian people had faced. Among the Serbian Canadians, Adam Pribicevic was among the most important, eminent, and well-known post-World War II Serbian political emigres who came from Yugoslavia to Canada. With two other authors, Dr. Vladimir Belajic and Dr. Branko Miluš, Adam Pribicevic sent the Memorandum of Crimes of Genocide Committed Against the Serbian People by the Government of the Independent State of Croatia during World War II, addressed to the 5th General Assembly of the United Nations in 1950. He committed suicide on February 7, 1957 in Windsor. The reason is not very clear, but it could be assumed that many terrible disappointments on the political scene of the disintegrated Kingdom of Yugoslavia and its successor, Socialist Yugoslavia, may have contributed to this de desperate act. From 2008, the new 16th Street in Boussier, a part of Belgrade, carries his name. Professor Rado Knežević was the son of Lazar Mileva. Prior to the outbreak of World War II, he was a professor of French literature at the University of Belgrade, and he had been a French language tutor to Prince Peter. He was also a prominent member of the Serbian Cultural Club. He was married and had two children. Mr. Knežević was a key member of the group of disgruntled former Karadjojević employees that organized the Yugoslav coup d'etat of March 1941 that deposed the regency of Prince Paul. Prince Regent Paul Karadjojević and his government were forced by allies to declare war without receiving any aid from them. He refused to throw his country into a suicidal situation and then joined Kingdom of Yugoslavia to the Tripartite Pact with great apprehension. Knežević was resolutely anti-Axis and remained a minister at the royal court in the temporary Simović government. The coup resulted in the German-led Axis invasion of Yugoslavia commencing on April 6, 1941, during which the armed forces of Yugoslavia were defeated within 11 days. Fleeing the country by air, Knežević remained with King Peter as a minister of the royal court and was part of the Yugoslav government in exile in London. The British ambassador to the Yugoslav government in exile from July 1941 until August of 1943, George William Rendell, was very conscious of the power wielded by Knežević, noting that he was by no means working in harmony with the government. A wartime British intelligence handbook described the Knežević brothers as the most powerful forces in the exiled Yugoslav government and the most instrumental in carrying through its chauvinistic Great Serb and anti-partisan policy. Brothers Knežević and other ministers of the Yugoslav government in exile battled amongst each other for the power positions in the future post-war government that the Chetnik resistant movement would secure for them. These power plays potentially led Great Britain to stop backing the Chetnik movement on the ground and cooling off relationship with the Allies. Knežević was urging the king to return to Serbia and lead the Chetnik resistance movement, giving it greater unity and stronger support by Allies. But Knežević's influence abated the moment he was sent to work in Lisbon as a charged affair at the Yugoslav Embassy in 1943. King refused his suggestion. After the war, Knežević remained in exile and was sentenced to 10 years of imprisonment with hard labor in absentia on charges of treason and war crimes during the Belgrade process. He immigrated to Canada where he was the editor of The Voice of Canadian Serbs from 1961 to 1974. In the early 50s, a dispute arose between between Cvetković and Knežević. 
Knezhevich wrote an article in the International Relations Journal, International Affairs, claiming that the Prince Paul and Svetkovich had formulated a secret plan to ally Yugoslavia with Germany and to gain control of the port of Salonika while Greece was defending against the Italian invasion. While Svetković issued two strong denials in the historical journey Documento Yugoslavi and stated that seizing Salonika had never been on the agenda of the Yugoslav government, the latter statement was not true. The main purpose of Knežević's allegations was to discredit Prince Paul and to portray the coup plotters in a favorable light. Knežević died in Montreal in 1981. Professor Jovan Jovetic was born in Podgornir, Cetinje in 1906. After elementary school, he completed a seminary in Cetinje and graduated from the Faculty of Theology in Belgrade. In 1933, he became a professor of theology at the St. Peter of Cetinje Serbian Orthodox Seminary. He was well respected professionally and personally in his native Montenegro. During 1941 and 1942 in the occupied Montenegro, the Italian forces encouraged a civilian strife between partisans and nationalists. The partisans targeted many intellectuals and well-respected nationalists to recruit them into their ranks. If anyone refused, they would be labeled as the enemy of the people and on many occasions liquidated. He was arrested by the Italian forces and only by the intervention of the Metropolitan of Montenegro, Ioanniki Lipovac, he was released. Professor Jovetic found this condition unbearable and joined the resistant movement of General Draja Mihailovic. Toward the summer of 1945, as the partisans were taking over more and more territories in U Yugoslavia, Chetnik forces were retreating through Bosnia and escaping into Italy. We do not have information where Professor Jovetic was located while in Italy. Toward the end of 1946, Professor Jovetic was sent with a group of theologians to England under the blessing of Patriarch Gavrilo. In 1947, he came to Canada, and in August of 1948, he became an editor-in-chief of the Voice of Canadian Serbs until September of 1953. He was well known and respected in Windsor, where he lived. Following this post, he also was an associate editor of the American Serbobran between 67 and 77. During this period, he wrote hundreds of articles, introductions, historical, political, and religious essays and discourses. He wrote both in Serbian and English. Alongside his doctorate in theology, he also possessed the doctorate in philosophy from Jan Hus University in USA. He was also working for the Srbadia Humanitarian Organization in Detroit as one of their board members and stayed in close relationship with Bishop Nikolai Velimirovich during 1953, who was at the time in a Russian monastery in the States. Later, when he moved to Toronto, Professor Jovetic collaborated often with Serbia, the newspaper of Mr. Jewich in Hamilton, which which reported on news from Yugoslavia from the Serbian nationalist viewpoint. The American Serbobran from Pittsburgh and Voice of Canadian Serbs received many of his articles. He was also involved in the life of the St. Sava Church Parish in Toronto as a board member of the church school congregation. When the current Bishop Georgi came to Toronto, Professor Jovetic offered his knowledge and became his first advisor and sincere associate. Professor Jovetic was one of the protagonists for initiating a diocesan Harold Istochnik. Professor Jovetic was never married, but loved life. He was a much respected member of the Serbian community at large and has contributed greatly towards its social and intellectual life. He was an active contributor to many newspapers and published books dealing with the political and social problems of the Serbs in socialist Yugoslavia and worldwide. He was described as a courageous and eloquent man, unaffected, and always favorably disposed for storytelling or instruction of some kind. He died in Toronto, sitting with the book in his hand. Borislav Todorovic was born in Belgrade in 1913. After Mr. Todorovic's father passed away, his mother Divna became a sole caregiver of their children Branislav, Natalia, and Borislav. Despite the horrors of World War I, she was able to raise her young fatherless family and sent her youngest son to the military academy. 
As a young army cadet, Todorovic was selected for advanced training at the Higher Yugoslav Military Academy and the War College in Belgrade. He graduated in 1939, ranking second in his class. He was then posted to a battalion garrison in Kraljevo and excelled at fencing, skiing, horseback riding. He loved the classics, theater, and good music, and was interested in politics and sociology. Stunned by the armistice of April 17, 1941, Todorovic could not accept the idea to just surrender without resistance and was hoping that many of his comrades had fled to the woods and were trying to get themselves organized for war. Captured by the Germans at the end of April, Todorovic was taken to Belgrade with, where the Germans promised to liberate anyone who did not consider him himself a Serb. To Todorovic, this was unthinkable and he vowed to escape from his captors and continued the fight for Serbian freedom. He, along with his friend, Captain Leonid Pashani, was sent to the Oflag 5th Day Barrack 17 near Offenbruck sometime in April of 1941. In their confinement, they made preparations to escape and were determined to take advantage of any chance to do so. At Offenburg, there were there were 1,200 Yugoslav officers who formed a fellowship called Barbed Wire Society with Milan Bogdanovic, the former director of the State Theatre at Novi Sad as chairman, and Bora Todorovic as the general secretary. The officers needed something to occupy themselves with and raise their spirits. News reached the camp of Serbian resistance against the Nazis of Draža Mihailović and his Ravnagora movement, which in the summer of 1941 struck the first blows against the occupiers, and inspired a national insurrection that almost swept the Germans out of Serbia and the Italians from Montenegro. For Bora Todorovic, the choice was easy, and he longed to be with Mihailovic in the free mountains of Serbia. In 1942, he was transferred to Oflag Dreizin B at Nuremberg, and later found himself in a cattle car, along with a thousand prisoners, on the way to Osnabrück or Poland. Todorovic and Pashani saw their chains. They escaped through the rear wi window and jumped from the moving train into darkness and uncertainty. On the run, they crossed Bavaria, reached occupied France, and by outwitting police agents, crossed into Vichy on May 17, 1942. There, they made their way to the Serbian community in Lyon, went on to Marseille, and then over the Pyrenees at night. Eluding the Spanish border guards, they finally re reached Madrid. With British help, they made their way to Gibraltar and then to England. After the debriefing by the British, Todorovic was sent to the Yugoslav Prime Minister's offices and assigned as ad adjutant to Major Zivan El Knežević, Secretary of the Yugoslav War Cabinet and the Chief of Military Affairs. In London, King Peter II presented Pashani and Todorovic with the White Eagle with Swords, the second highest Yugoslav decoration for bravery. Todorovic was dumbfounded as he fervently believed that escape was basic duty of every prisoner of war. After a month of London politics, he wanted more and more to be with the man he had, he had come to consider a great patriot, General Draža Mihailović, the leader of the Chetnik resistance. Todorovic writes, I decided a month after my arrival to volunteer to return to Yugoslavia. There I expected to find true and sincere fighters for liberty and democracy. There my dream was alive. After parachuting into Yugoslavia during a September night of 1943, he finally reached his destination, the camp of General Draža Mihailović. Some were inspired by his calls for social justice in a new society built upon a solid foundation of democratic principles. And then there were those who thought he was but insurance for their own futures in Yugoslavia ruled by a king. Major Bora Todorovic left Yugoslavia with the American Army Mission and arrived in Washington as a general's personal representative in April of 1944. However, President Roosevelt's order to aid Mihailovic was countermanded at the personal request of Mr. Ch Churchill. The Great Britain had withdrawn its support for Chetniks and the Serbian government in exile. Todorovic felt he needed to return to Yugoslavia but was put on house arrest by the British in Bari, but he was later released after 
the American army representatives intervened. Throughout his lifetime, Borat Todorovic continued to write for the Voice of Canadian Serbs, especially for the Christmas edition, signing his articles with his name, initials BJT, or with his pseudonym Serafim. He devoted his, himself to the cause of General Draža Mihailović and his supporters, both in the homeland and abroad, through many articles he wrote for American Serbobran and the Voice of Canadian Serbs. From November 1946 to August of 1948, he was the editor in chief of the Voice of Canadian Serbs in Windsor. From 48 to 53, at the request of the U.S. State Department, Bora Todorovic joined the Voice of America as an editor and broadcaster in the Yugoslav section of the international radio station. Branko Mimedović was born in Sarajevo. His father, Ljubomir, was from Nekšić and his mother, Ilinka, was from Risan in Boka. They moved a lot because his father was a captain in the Yugoslav Royal Army. To illustrate how often they moved exactly, it is useful to observe Branko's education. He completed the primary school in Novi Pazar and Kosovska Mitrovica, High school he attended in Kragovac and Knjaževac and eventually graduated in Zaječar. All of these locations are in present-day Serbia. After graduation, Branko continued moving on to Belgrade to attend the Yugoslav Royal Military Academy and after he completed the first year, the World War II started. The official military resistance to the German invasion lasted 11 days and Branko was in the southern city Foča, where he left for Nikšić. Italian invading forces in Montenegro captured and disarmed him and gave him a safe passage to return to Serbia and his hometown Knjaževac. After Serbian military forces under the command of German occupying divisions formed, Branko enrolled into the ranks of the Serbian State Guard and served as an officer in Belgrade, Užice and Laskovac until 1944. That year he joined the other national military forces and reti retreated into Bosnia. At the moment of German capitulation, Branko was hospitalized in Felkrich in Austria, close to the border with Switzerland. The journey through Bosnia, Croatia, and Slovenia into Austria to the liberated territory, he endured tremendous physical hardships. As he was of sensitive health to begin with, this retreat only aggravated it so that Branko contracted tuberculosis. Once he was discharged from the hospital, Branko joined the French First Army located in that zone of Austria. He was given a position of the cen censorship of the mail. Then he went to the American zone of influence into the officer camp in Ponga, where he stayed all up to 1947. The next stop for Branko was Innsbruck, where he began his university studies being fluent in German. Simultaneously, he found a job as the inventory officer with the French Army Command. Branko decided to immigrate to Canada, and he arrived in May of 1948. His first destination was Alberta, where he needed to work his ticket on various farms. He couldn't endure such hard physical labor because of his health that was already damaged from war, imprisonment, and migrations. In 1950, he finally arrives to Windsor. The, fr the first day upon arrival to Windsor, Branco started collaborating as a writer for the Voice of Canadian Serbs, where he became the longest standing columnist of almost 50 years. His column was called A Bit of Everything for Everyone. He published many articles, poems, book reviews, and li literary commentaries in The Voice and in the American Srbobran. Ivan Kozivic and Bra Branko married few years upon his arrival. They have two daughters, Milena and Ilinka, and a son, Ljubomir. He was an active member of the Serbian National Shield Society of Canada, Serbian Church School Congregation Gračanica and Windsor, as well as few other cultural societies, and the Legion of War Veterans. Branko lived in Chatham and worked for many years in the men's fashion store. 
His social life was very dynamic and he mostly spent his time with Mirko Marjanović, Velimir Toškovic, Simo Zečević, Đuro and Mane Vrga, and Pavlica and Radonić families. Branko is remembered as a very intelligent family man with deep religious devotion to church, of a quiet, sensitive and a bit of poetic character. He was very talented for writing and spoke German, French and English and was a very well educated man. Poetry was his passion since he attended primary school and the great part of his poems were lost or destroyed because of the war. He continued writing in Canada during his spare time when he was working on the farms in Alberta, on the railroad construction locations or at the men's fashion boutique. Those poems are mainly expressions of his nostalgia for home, yearning for pain for his past and disturbance stored the uncertain future. His verses reflect all of his disappointed hopes, traumas, and preserved memories of lost loves, family, and country. Branko never returned to Yugoslavia, though in Canada he was surrounded with his brother's family and many loyal friends. He passed away in 1994 and left a great void in the literary and intellectual circles of Windsor and Ontario. His son Ljubomir still lives in Chatham. His daughter Ilinka lives in Vancouver with her two children, and his daughter Milena lives in Windsor. His older brother Stanko also passed on, but his wife Rada Memedovic still loves to talk about her favorite brother-in-law. Mr. Milorad Gacisha was born in Gracac in 1920. He grew up with his five older and two younger sisters of father Nikola and mother Milica. His younger sister Radojka moved to Germany with her husband Gojko, who now lives in Chicago. Milorad and Milka have three daughters, Snežana, Božana and Julka, and a son Nikola. Milorad finished technical school in Yugoslavia and worked on a railroad as a supervisor. He had very good knowledge of construction work. Seven days after he married Milka Vrzic, he was recruited into the Royal Yugoslav Army Engineering Regiment in Slovenia. At the start of World War II, Yugoslavian Royal Army quickly disintegrated due to the sabotage of Croatian Nazi supporters, so Milorad made his way back home to Gračac. When the independent state of Croatia was formed in 1941, Milorad's father and another 12 members of the family were killed, and Milorad survived by escaping into the mountains. Soon after, Milorad and Milka decided to move to Italian-occupied Dalmatia, where he joined the Chetnik resistance movement into the regiment from his native Gračac. Under the pressure of the Red Army, Dinara Mountain Chetnik's division, where Mil Milorad served, started retreating towards Italy. On May 6, 1945, that entire division went under the command of the British Army instead of returning home. Milorad spent almost two years in the military and civilian camps in Italy and Germany until King Charles V of England declared on July 22, 1947 that all Chetniks were allowed to settle anywhere in the Western world. Milorad went to England on December 31, 1947. Milorad went to Scotland where he worked in the coal mines around Stoke and Trent. On March 13, 1953, Milorad had settled in Windsor, where some of his army colleagues had arrived a li little earlier. Milorad worked at Ford, Duplay Glass, General Foods, and finally at N&D Supermarket, where he stayed for 27 years until his retirement. Aside from his existential hardships, Milorad was very active and successful as an activist in the Serbian community. He held various positions at the executive board of the Gracchainza Serbian Church. He was an administrator at the Avala Printing and Publishing Company between 1956 and 1983. He also worked with the Serbian Business Professional Association, Ser Serbian National Defense Organization, and was a contributor to the Voice of Canadian Serbs newspaper over the years. Rose Kosanovic was born in East Chicago to Serbian parents. Her father, Jovo Trubovic, and her mother and grandparents came from Gomirje in present-day Croatia. Her mother, Milica, was born in East Pittsburgh. 
They were married in 1920 in the St. George Serbian Orthodox Church in Indiana Harbor. The Trebovich family loved to write and they have written a good number of articles for American Serbobran and other smaller Serbian language publications in Chicago. Since Rose was raised in such an atmosphere, she naturally decided to study journalism at the University of Missouri in Columbia, graduating in 1949. After unsuccessful job searches close to home, Rose went to St. Angel in Texas. It was less than a year she was there before a job opened up at home. She went back and wrote for society pages at the local paper called the Hammond Times in Hammond, Indiana, just outside of Chicago. Several years later, she was offered to work at the news desk and report on the life of Chicago and the area. In 1953, she joins the International Experimental Living Organization, which was sending young Americans all over the world and asked them to report on various lifestyles. Rose visited Yugoslavia and had an opportunity to visit President Tito and obtain a short interview. On May 11, 1963, Rose married a Windsor at Juro Kosanovic and moved there the same year. She found work with the local daily newspaper Windsor Star and wrote its Tuesday's column on topics such as family, challenges of raising children, Windsor's interesting events, etc. She was an English section editor of the Voice of Canadian Serbs newspaper between 1968 and 1970 in Windsor. Mrs. Kosanovic was also very involved with writing, editing, and proofreading of a variety of anniversary books that a number of cultural organizations published in Windsor over the years. She is considered as one of the most active writers in the Serbian community here, and some of her work has been included over the years into the museum collection. Fedorajic was born in Yugoslavia and as a member of the Yugoslav water polo team escaped to Austria in 1951, immigrating and settling in Canada around the same time. He studied law for three years at the University of Belgrade. He graduated in finance and business management from the University of Detroit and did his postgraduate work at the Wayne State University in Michigan. From 1957 to 1963, he managed and edited The Voice of Canadian Serbs, at the time acknowledged as the leading Serbian publication in North America. During the same period, he published and edited a monthly political review of the liberal democratic orientation, the democratic thought, and the periodical Yugoslav Observer in Windsor. Since 1959, he was also active in Canadian political life as a member, organizer, and an executive of the Canadian Liberal Party. From 1959 to 1967, he acted as a close associate and aide of the Honorable Paul Martin, who served as Canada's Deputy Prime Minister, Chairman of NATO, and the Canadian High Commissioner in the United Kingdom. His functions included party and election campaign organization, fundraising, political advisor, administrative assistance, and speech writing. From 1969 to 1982, he continued on as a campaign manager, fundraiser, and, and a political advisor to the Honorable Mark McGeehan, Minister of Justice and External Affairs in the Trudeau government. He also served as a delegate to the Liberal Party National Convention, as an executive officer of the party, member of the Canadian delegation to the UN General Assembly, and of the various other committees and groups on external affairs. In 1966, Mr. Fedorajic established, owned, directed and managed the Arvid Machine Tools group of companies, which reached the rank of the second largest Canadian and sixth in North America manufacturer of transfer lines and special machinery for the aut automobile industry while its subsidiary Intercane Systems achieved a leading position in automated machinery for the sugarcane, wood, and substitute products in the world. Headquartered in Windsor, the company had its subsidiaries in the States, United Kingdom, Brazil, Colombia, Hong Kong, and the Philippines. Mr. Wright retired from active management in 91 and had since established a business management, financial, foreign relations, and peer consultancy. Member of the Canadian Institute for Strategic Studies, Rotary and other service and charitable clubs, organizations and foundations. Mr. Raich was married to Audrey for 22 years, who resides in Windsor with two grown-up sons and a daughter. Michael of Vancouver, 
Alexander of Toronto and Anastasia and her husband Leroy of Lawrenceville, Georgia. Mr. Reich was a contributing writer to the Voice of Canadian Serbs. In 2004, the, the numerous articles written for the Voice of Canadian Serbs were compiled and published under the title O Tempora O Mores. Memoirs of Fedor's Life will be publish, published at a later date. Fedor Reich passed away after a short illness in 2012, surrounded by his family at 82 years of age. In these pictures, you see George Veličković, Branko Malešević, and Žarko Vučinić. These three men have each in their own way recorded the history of the Serbian community in Windsor. George Veličković recorded the history of Gračanica Serbian Church Congregation, its beginnings, families who built it, major events and organizations that are affiliated with it. Branko Malešević was more interested in the athletic activities of the same community and the history of it, the different clubs and the achievements over the past 80 years. Žarko Vučinić was recording the history of the St. Dimitrius Church School Congregation and its achievements, projects, affiliations and members. Because of their interest in good writing, they managed to capture the fabric of the Serbian community and laid a foundation for future research. Mr. Georgi Vlijičković was born in 1945 in Belgrade. His father, Gruja, who was a prominent and a very successful businessman, and his mother, Emilia, were married before the World War II started. They lived through the war by hiding people who were sought by the German Nazis or helping others to escape the horrors raging in areas that were under control of Croatian Nazis. They were jailed several times and Mother Emilia spent several months while pregnant in a concentration camp, Banica. At the end of the war, all of their property was nationalized and the family moved into Gruja's old company offices. They remained to live in Belgrade, but jobs were scarce for those who were not of the same political fabric as the majority. Branislav and George completed their primary and high education. In 1964, Branislav went on to the States for university studies. George graduated from the University of Belgrade with a degree in mechanical engineering in 1969. Just before finishing his university education, Georgia was selected to play for the Yugoslav national rugby team, which secured his passport for traveling. Instead of spending a year and a half serving in the compulsory military service, George made a decision to finally leave the country and look for a better future. George left for Germany. His work as a professional started in Stuttgart. Because of a contract commitment and future plans for Canada, he rejected an option to work for Mercedes-Benz in Unterurkheim. Instead, he obtained an immigrant visa for Canada. By the end of February 1970, all the documents were in order and the path to Canada was open. Once he finally arrived, he did not know any English, nor did he know his distant cousins who came to greet him. They took him to London, Ontario, where they lived, but Georgi could not find a job in his field without speaking English. Within three months, he moved to Toronto in, ho in hopes he could find better opportunities there. He found many friends and a person who will help him find work at Chrysler in Windsor. Fortunately, his supervisor was an Austrian with whom he was able to communicate and create reports in German. However, the change was necessary. After passing English proficiency test, George was accepted in the Masters of Engineering program at the University of Windsor. Mr. Velichkovich completed his requirements in 1973 and became employed with the Chrysler Corporation in Highland Park in Michigan. Chrysler offered its employees a range of various classes for self-improvement with the University of Michigan, Michigan State, Oakland, Walsh College, etc. George took advantage of some of these offers and during his 35 years with Chrysler he completed over 50 different courses, after which he retired. Playing rugby in Canada was a significant part of George's life. Playing rugby and socializing with the rugby team, without any Serbian-speaking person in sight, was the best and fastest way to learn the language. Later, he joined a team of players over 35 years of age and traveled all over the world for competitions. George also met his future wife Susan, who came to watch a game. They met at the Windsor Stadium in 1970. They were married in 73 in the Gratanica Church in Windsor and they settled in South Windsor. 
They have three children, Milan, Branka and Tanya. Georgia was also involved in soccer through Windsor Serb Soccer Club, which already existed for several decades. He worked on developing youth teams and creating a Serbian North American soccer competitions. Aside from great love for and involvement in the sport, George was also very active within the Serbian community at large. He joined the membership of the church school congregation, the Giants, in 73. For the next 40 years, George and his family have contributed financially, held various positions, volunteered their services, and became an instrumental and integral part of the church congregation. For almost three decades, George declined to become president of this congregation, but rather accepted work in the background, holding various positions through the years, ranging from the audit board to a vice president. The main scope of his activities were in fundraising, recruiting for athletic activities, and establishing the tournaments, designing the construction of the Grachayitsa church premises, and the Serbian Community Center. When it comes to his writing, Mr. Vilichkovic collected the information, historical data, and photos, and he did the entire setup for the book for the 50th anniversary of the church school congregation Grachayitsa. After two years of tedious and hard work, the 300 pages booklet was printed with the help from Mishic Printing with a minimum cost to the congregation. The cost for the printing was almost completely covered by the cost of ads and family history pages. Mr. Vilichkovic was also a part of the SNF Lodge Committee that hosted several sports tournaments in Windsor. Moreover, he contributed many articles for the Serbian papers in diaspora, Voice of Canadian Serbs, Srbobran Serbia, as well as for a local parish news bulletin. May of 2013 marked the 40th anniversary of the founding of Windsor Serbs Soccer Club, in which Branko Mališević actively participated. At the same time, he celebrates the same amount of time spent on research and writing on the athletic activities of Serbs in Windsor. During those years, Mr. Malešević was the editor of the Sports News, a newsletter of the Windsor Serb Soccer Club, Chess Bulletin of the Serbian Chess Society, Chess News of the Windsor Chess Club. He was also the editor of Bulletin and the Maple Leaf Cyclists of the Maple Leaf Cycling Club. The book, Sports Activity of Windsor Serbs 1929-1979, was published in 1980 and it is the first book where the sports activities of one ethnic community were described. It is really the first book of its kind in Canada. The same year, Mr. Malešević published another book, Janko Majstorović, Ratnik i Radnik, based on a life story of this immigrant. Serbs in Windsor was published at Herald Press in 2013. As a secretary of the committee for the celebration of the 200th anniversary of birth of Vuk Stefanović Karadžić, he participated in the realization of a very rich program which lasted during the entire Jubilee year. He is the founder and the first president of the chess club Svetozar Gligoric in Windsor and Serbian Chess Association in Ontario. Mr. Malešević wrote about some of these activities and many more topics to Veterni Novosti, Vesti, Zavičaj, Radio Belgrade, Voice of Canadian Serbs, American Srbobran, and many other newspapers. Žarko Vučinić was born in Srpske Moravice in Yugoslavia in 1921. He lived with his father Simeon, mother Latinka, and his nine brothers and sisters. Simeon went to the States with his brother Jovo when he was 18 for work, and upon his return he became a wood merchant. Eventually he owned a sawmill and a farm. Žarko attended public school in his hometown and traveled to Korenica, Karlovac and Susak for his high school. After high school, Žarko attended industrial school for a short time. Then he entered into the army as a volunteer. He had been in the army for two months when the World War II started. He left Yugoslavia and went to Italy. From there, he went to Germany. And on August 16, 1948, Žarko and his wife Bosanka immigrated to Canada on the condition that he and his wife would live separately and work on a farm for one year's time for $1 a day wages. Upon arrival to Canada, government clerks took them to the tobacco farm in Oakville. Afterwards, they moved to Windsor in hopes of securing better employment. After a few unsuccessful tries and some layoffs, 
Mr. Vucinic found out that Duffy's Tavern was for sale for $135,000 and a $45,000 down payment. This was in 1959. He spoke with two other people who he thought would have been interested to become partners. They were Dusan Obradovic, who was a priest, and Milos Jojic, and the three of them purchased the tavern. The three partners were able to get a mortgage for $90,000 at 4% interest. The owner changed his mind and walked out of the deal. Mr. Duffy's lawyer asked the three partners to pay the down payment in $10 bills. The lawyer representing the three partners, Frank Montello, was able to get them to tavern after all. By this time, Jarko and Bosonka had three children and after the sale they moved to Amherstburg. One of the partners left to open his own business in 61 and the other one left in 66 to buy the Lakeshore Tavern outside of Amherstburg. Bosanka was a tavern's cook and took care of the kitchen. When Mr. Vucinic took over, the tavern was an ordinary house sitting 57 chairs according to the original liquor license, a couple of small rooms and a tiny bar. There was also enough room for docking of about 30 small boats. Mr. Vucinic remodeled it in 1961, 1963 and in 1970 when a motel with 17 rooms was built adjacent to the tavern. The tavern was remodeled three or four times altogether since the purchase. In 1990, Mr. Vucinic built the marina for 80 boats for $400,000. Remodeling of a hotel at the time cost around a million. Business currently employs about 60 persons with an average pay of $60,000 a year. Aside from his business expertise, Mr. Vucinic had many more accomplishments in his lifetime. He was the president of the Lions Club, he was a long-standing president of the Essex County Hotel and Motel Association, he was a member of the Diocese Council, he was the president of the Church Board of the St. Dimitri, he was a member of the Serbian Veterans Association, a member of the Serbian National Council, and a member of the Serbian National Shield Society. Mr. Vucinic was an active member of the Serbian Church Congregation, but after the separation of 1963, he became a member of the St. Dimitri Serbian Orthodox Church and has contributed in many ways. He is well known for the writings he did in the anniversary book, the 25th anniversary of St. Dimitri, and the 30th anniversary of the St. Dimitri. As a longtime president for the St. Dimitri Church School congregation, he is its historian as well. Mr. Blažo Brukovic was born in Windsor and he's an accountant by profession. He's a board member of the Serbian National Shield Society of Canada, a president of the Yugoslav Crown in Windsor, and a community historian. He writes obituaries for the Serbian community in Windsor, Detroit, Hamilton, and Toronto. Radislav Grujicic was born in 1911 in Celebic in Bosnia. He graduated from the University of Belgrade with a law degree in 1936. He worked as a reporter at a national newspaper called Student News, and in 1933 he became the owner and editor of the agrarian student newspaper Youth Village. In 1937 and 38, he also worked on editing the more political newspaper Agrarian Movement. His postgraduate studies he started in Bratislava and Prague in Czech Republic, sponsored by the Czech government. Unfortunately, his studies came to an abrupt end with the beginning of the World War II and Radislav returned home. In 1939, he accepted a post in the government department for the political affairs and was later promoted into the assistant of the chief of the 4th Department of Belgrade Special Police. He continued working for this department even though Serbia was under German occupation. His love of writing produced a discourse called Fight Against Communism and Serbian State in 1944, which was destroyed as the communist forces entered Belgrade. In the fall of 1944, he retreated before the advancement of the Red Army and went into Western Europe. He arrived to Canada in 1948. After very difficult beginnings in Canada, where he worked a number of odd jobs, Radislav was able to devote himself to antique book sales. 
During his free time, he was writing poetry, newspaper articles, and prose. He was mainly writing for Sloboda, newspaper from Chicago, and American Serbobran from Pittsburgh. His books were also published in the same newspaper in the form of a serial publication, A National Question Through the Prism of the Communist Literature and Documentation, Poems and Stories, Essays on Serbian Literature and Authors of the 19th and 20th Century, and Memories from the Civil War and Revolution. Mr. Grujic was a very private person, very educated, and very devoted to literature and writing. Norma Tomic Bulat was born in 1919 in Aradac, Yugoslavia, and she passed away in 2009 in Windsor. She came to Windsor in 1928 with her parents Dimitri and Grozda Tomic, and she married Dan Bulat in 1937. Norma pursued many interests, including helping to run her brother-in-law's Bullets Market on Druller Road. In 1956, she opened up her own business called Norma's Beauty Salon, and in 1967, she became a real estate agent. She was a very active member of the Circle of Serbian Sisters, Princess Helen, and wrote a book, Follow Your Rainbow, which is an account of her arrival and life in Windsor. Biljana Djelevic wrote a book on her father, Jakša Djelevic, who was a member of the Chetnik resistance movement of General Draža Mihailović in Serbia during World War II. This author lived in Windsor for a period in her life, and afterwards she retired to a monastery in the States. This is the only book she wrote and published. Serbian National Federation, in collaboration with the Gracanica Church and the Serbian Crown, published booklets that accompanied sports tournaments that were held over the years in Windsor, and which were organized and sponsored by the local Serbian families and businesses. These souvenir books are also the evidence and document on the economic life of the community because it lists the numerous businesses that sponsored the event in one way or another.